Um, howdy, uh, my name's Case. Um, so, as mentioned, this is about SecComp, which is not an LSM, and all the small LSMs. Um, uh, there was going to be a little bit of background to distinguish these the, the two, uh, and then I'll get into a quick overview of LoadPin and Yama, and finally SecComp, which uh, is a bit more complex than the others. Um, so as you've already seen, there's a, a bunch of the larger LSMs that exist uh, in the kernel. And the way I sort of look at it is they have you know, a, a comprehensive policy, they're full-blown mandatory access control systems, um, they mediate all kinds of different things, files, networks, et cetera. Um, and the, the small or minor LSMs have a really, really narrow um, policy. Um, they're usually a, a fixed policy. Um, so the first of these is, uh, is LoadPin. Um, easy to turn on. Uh, so the main, the main use for LoadPin is if you have, um, if you think module SIG force, which is uh, your resulting kernel will only load modules that have been cryptographically signed. Um, it, it will refuse to load anything else. Um, if you feel that that is redundant in your environment, um, load pin is for you. Uh, the idea being that if you already have a trusted file system that you've cri cryptographically signed all the way down from your you know, uh, root of trust, you have all the bells and whistles that you've uh, heard about in, in some of the other presentations um, you know, with various signing and other things, uh, you probably don't need the kernel to have, you know, you don't need to waste the storage space of signatures on the modules and waste the CPU space of checking the signature on the thing you already checked at a file system level is correct. Um, and so LoadPin simply makes sure that what you're loading from uh, on the kernel side actually came from the file system you have cryptographically been checking in some way. Um, Chrome OS uses this with DM Verity because DM Verity has already done the block level analysis to say that everything's okay. Um, and the benefit of having this as an LSM hook is you actually, LoadPin can check things beyond just modules. There's a lot of other stuff that the kernel reads out of file systems that it uses for, uses for its own purpose. Um, for example, you know, K executing to an entirely other kernel loading firmware into various things, uh, security policies, certificates, there's a whole bunch of stuff that the kernel uh, uses for itself that it gets off of a file system. Uh, so there's no reason to do a verification, you know, do a, an additional signature check when you may have already done that in the past already. Um, load pin is pretty stable, um, perhaps because only Chrome OS is using it. Uh, I'm not sure, I haven't heard uh, from any other people. Um, Having been pretty stable, I poked a couple things into uh, for, for 420 um, as part of some of the stacking work uh, that Casey talked about. Uh, it became obvious that there was some terminology confusion in LoadPin, as LoadPin was always enabled, it just wasn't paying attention. Um, so it was doing some tracking in the background. Uh, so the idea of enforcement versus enabling, so I borrowed the enforced terminology. And then uh, I finally got frustrated enough with some of the error reporting on it that I went and made sure to figure out how to get uh, readable, um, you know, human readable device names out of the reporting. Um, so, a quick demo that has lost all of its colors. What in the world? One second. No, they're here. It's in the preview, and now it's gone. That sucks a lot. Hold on one second. I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to fix this in a different way. Like I'm not crazy, right? You can see, ooh. Yeah, those colors are there. <laughs> so hopefully we're out this impress. Is Great. I had to update this morning for that. I know what I'm going to do. Yep. 
<laughs> I'll use my own link. Do, 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 do. No, I don't want to read from there. Hold on. Sorry. Is there a present mode? Oh, I get to do this blind. This is going to be awesome. Uh, eh, eh. Yeah, I know, but that's really small and far away. Don't want you. Yay, I'm sort of there. Okay. It's really helpful to be able to see. <laughs> um, okay, load pin demo, back to this. Uh, this is a quick view of, say, slash temp in red and slash trusted, which let's say you've been cryptographically checking, um, and you go and do an ins mod on some module out of trusted, and if you look at the D message output, uh, this one happens to say, hey, you, you turns out you're the backing device for this file system is in fact writable. Uh, so I'm not even gonna pretend that this is an enforceable situation, but for testing, sure, we'll pretend that it's loadable, but you can turn this on and off. Uh, the, day, the idea being that you can do a testing of your load pin stuff uh, in an environment that's writable, um, but once you actually have a, a read-only backing uh, block device, it will not print that out. Um, so then it reports in yellow what type of thing uh, it's trying to load and says, yay, I have, I have pinned this module, I'm now gonna trust trusted. Um, and then you can unload the module and then you're gonna reinsert another module out of slash temp. And it says, that kernel module has been denied out of temp, I don't like you. And then if you unmount whatever file system you had been trusting, load pin says, hey, you took the file system away, I have no idea how to find it again, so I'm never gonna let you load anything else again. Um, anyway, that's sort of the rundown on easy load pin things. Uh, Yama, this, uh, this was the first uh, of the stacked LSMs, so uh, sorry, not sorry. Um, and it narrows the scope of the, the ptrace, ptrace access checks that were uh, in the kernel. Um, because it used to be quite a, a wide open thing. You could just ptrace anything as your user ID. Uh, the basic goal here was to increase the amount of time it would be necessary for someone who has broken into your device to steal all your stuff. Um, because if you have password protected things, someone's going to try to you know, drop malware so that you would run, you know, you're gonna write, you're gonna run GPG or something, and they'd re have replaced your GPG, but they have to wait for you to actually do those things to get at your credentials. Um, whereas if they can break in and ptrace everything on your system, they can pull credentials out of running programs, uh, they can attach to your SSH tunnels and jump down to the next machine that you happen to be on. I mean, it, it ought, the, the ptrace is kind of scary in that you could just do anything as that user and expand the scope of your attack immediately without having to wait for a moment when you would take advantage of some user action. You would trick someone into doing something. Um, so it's certainly not a, a silver bullet, but it does change the, the access controls on how that's supposed to look. Um, this is also pretty stable, uh, and, I'll, and most distros uh, are using it. And of course, I had to write that, and Syscaller, who has been running for I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of hours in various places, uh, just sent one bug that it hasn't been able to re reproduce in four days. Um, so there may be an RCU bug in here. Got a couple people are helping me look at it. Um, and I may have some future work cut out for me because Jan Horn, who likes breaking the world, uh, has started looking at Yama. Um, so demo here, again, colors were important. So as I said before, before Yama with standard uh, DAC access checks on Ptrace, um, if you are the blue evil attacker, um, you can get at anything that is the same user ID. And this is sort of an example LS tree output. So the first two are 
UID root, and then everything else is, is me. So as that attacking process, it could ptrace into anything uh, owned by me, uh, short of things that had explicitly made themselves undumpable, but very few things do that. Um, this isn't great because it can go jump around and pull things out of secret and not, not so great. Uh, now, of course, with DAC, it can't go read systemd or some other user's stuff. So with the YAML, all that goes away. Can't get into anything because the check that the ptrace YAML will do now is it says, all right, let's look at secret and I'll walk up the ancestry tree. I'll say, okay, is bash trying to ptrace me? No. Is systemd trying to ptrace me? No. Okay, I'm not going to let this happen. Um, however, this, uh, so this, this continues to work in situations where you're debugging stuff. Um, GDB launches some program and says, I want to ptrace that program, and Yama starts walking up the ancestry tree and says, uh, is GDB my parent? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, this is allowed. Um, but this situation would break crash handlers because you'd start some program, say Chrome, uh, and it would, it would crash, and then the crash handler would actually fork an exec a handler to deal with it and connect back, um, which would break because it, you know, it would this Yama yeah, would walk up the ancestry tree and say, "Is the crash handler part, you know, an ancestor of mine?" No, it's not Bash. It's not Systemd in this example. Um, so that wasn't great. So we had to add some whitelisting that, with the crashing program, could declare just as it's beginning to die. Wait, wait, this guy just forked. I want that to be able to ptrace me. So you'd declare a whitelist. Uh, and then the crash handler would sort of be implicitly part of your ancestry tree that was doing the checking. Um, and there's SecCom. So this is not an LSM. Uh, LSM is, uh, you know, as discussed earlier, are sort of hooks into the kernel uh, in lots of stable places where you have access to all the resources you want to be checking. Um, it doesn't cover all, uh, doesn't call all, cover all sysc calls. Uh, because not all the things you want to mediate from an LSM uh, are available there. Uh, but there's a lot of things you don't necessarily want programs to be running, so there needed to be a way to filter at the system call level. Um, one problem with this, of course, is you could, you know, if as a malicious person trying to trick a set UAD program into doing something dumb, you could, for example, uh, convince it that it, it, some program had in fact successfully dropped its privileges when it didn't. So if you were able to filter uh, a set UID program, you could convince it to do bad things. Uh, so no new privs, the no new privs bit was invented to say, well, if you try to exec something with a filter, you know, with no new privs set up, you can't actually get it to be set UID. So you have to either be an admin or set no new privs so you can't actually trick anything into uh, doing this. So that, that was a problem with SecComp very early on in the design that got added that's used uh, pretty, pretty uh, widely uh, with SecComp. So this is in all kinds of things. I went and looked at another list and was terrified to see how much stuff uh, is using SecComp uh, a lot. But it's pretty easy to add. Uh, so the examples I'll be using are with MiniJail, which was uh, built for Chrome OS, uh, but we use it in Android now uh, on a lot of things. And it's sort of a collection of all the different container options you can pick and choose. But uh, if you're going to do normal filtering, I strongly recommend uh, libsepcop. makes things a lot easier. Uh, and if you want to do really special things, you probably need to learn BPF. And note that this is actually a subset of classic BPF. It's the seccomp portion. And it's definitely not eBPF yet. Um, but uh, there's the link off here is uh, f for fan Michael Karras' great uh, presentation he did a couple days ago. Uh, he gets really into a lot of the details. Um, so there, the basic bit of SecComp is the BPF is a Ber Berkeley packet filter that was trying to sort of have a way to look at packets in memory uh, in the kernel. Um, so there's this idea of... Um, yeah, I'm getting off cycle a little bit. Okay, um, that's get it. Uh, it was looking at a linear uh, bit of memory. So instead of looking at a packet, you can instead look at the details for a syscall. Um, so the which which system call number it is, what architecture it is, the instruction pointer, and the basic arguments. Um, 
and you can't actually read user space, you can't read the memory that any of these arguments might be pointing to uh, because you would be later racing the kernel who would try to copy that same memory out. Uh, so there's sort of a, a standing problem with that. So setcomp only looks at the actual pointer values. Um, once you make the matches you want, you can actually spit out uh, a lot of different uh, things for the filter to do. Um, the, the most severe thing lower on the list is what will win if there's multiple filters running uh, against the syscall. So either you can allow it, you can log it, um, you can trace it if you have a ptrace manager for the process. You can have the syscall get skipped and fake an error for it. Um, you could use that on open. Instead of killing the process, uh, you would say, oh, that file's just not available, and the pro program will continue running. Um, a trap is to actually deliver a catchable sig sys signal um, if you want something, if you want the program to deal with it in some way. Uh, and if you say kill thread, it'll kill that specific thread of execution. If you say kill process, it'll take out the entire thread group. Um, recent developments, uh, Tyco has been working tirelessly to get um, user notification in. Uh, there's sort of a problem with the trace return here in that you may have a manager say inside, you know, say someone's running GDB or you're running a uh, different init or something that's using ptrace to do normal operations uh, and you're, you want to use this for a container or some other situation. You can't really do a trace because it would be already being traced, but you still want to get information out of filters and sort of block and do things. Um, so trying to get away from using ptrace to get notifications about when things are happening out of seccomp. Um, at the very least, we know the things it won't be. <laughs> um, that's, that's what we've got out of the, description, out of the discussions. Um, but uh, I think there's, there's more to happen there. Um, and for a quick demo across a couple pages, I'm gonna try to slightly get this lined up. No, never mind. So I'm using MiniJail as a demo quickly. Um, what, what it's got here is dash S, I mentioned earlier, is for specifying a, a seccomp policy and that's in some file called cat.policy, and we're gonna just run the program cat to print out the policy, so I can I have a self-documenting demo. Um, and this fails immediately. Okay, I got a sig abort out of it. Why you go look at syslog, because that's where MiniGL puts its information and says, okay, some permission denied. What access is, you know, what error code is that? Let's go look at the man page for seccomp. Uh, oh, error access says I'm either I need to be cap sysadmin or use or set no new privs. Well, I'm not cap sysadmin here. Um, is there a way in mini jail to get to new, set no new privs? Oh yes, it's minus n. So okay, I need to add minus n. Now it'll run. And this is a basic policy of the minimum set of syscalls needed to have cat actually run. You need open at and f stat, m map. Uh, you can read all of those, but I mean they're a relatively basic set of syscalls to look at a file, open it, print it out, and close stuff and clean up. Um, now if I change a little piece of this, and, I, and for the open at, instead of saying it's allowed with the, the one that's on here, I can actually say, um, let's say have it return e val. So this is the return error no piece. And I run it with that policy, and you can see immediately that it tries to go along, do its job, hits the open, and the seccomp policy gets in the way and says, uh, you know, no, that's invalid, uh, matching what I asked it to reply, uh, return with. So, okay, what if we want to change what we're running? What if I want to run ls on this file? What happens? Okay, so I get another error, and I got to look in syslog again, and it says, okay, I died with signal 31. Okay, yes, that's sig sys, it was killed because it ran some other new thing. How do I figure out what system call it was actually using? Let's use strace. Um, and I see it starts to try to run IO control and is immediately killed by sig sys. It's like, okay, I'll just add IO control and I can get fancy now and actually check arguments. And I say, I want the first argument to be, you know, um, matching what's here for my standard in, out, out. And um, you just sort of repeat this cycle until you get all the syscalls uh, that you think you're gonna need for your program. This is the basic way to go through it. Um, and that's it. Those are the three. So, um, yeah. Catch us up on time a little bit. Questions? Is it a question? 
you say <coughs> something again about the race that you said about the referencing the pointers? Yes. So doo -doo -doo, here, I'll go back up. Um, so what you get in this, um, so for example, let's say you're, uh, you've got a, a management process that's watching some, uh, some set comp program. Uh, and you get a ptrace trap out of it. And you're just like, OK, I want to look at this open. And I want to figure out what file it's actually asking to be open. So you look at the, the argument um, for it. And you say, OK, the first argument is the pointer into the user space memory of this process. And I'm going to go look at what file it is. And it says, oh, I want to open, I don't know, uh, var log syslog. Um, and you say, OK, yes, I approve of that. Let's go ahead and let it continue. And you release the process. And right after you release it, you know, some other thread of the process, some other malicious thread has been sitting there you know, waiting for some signal. And it quickly changes what was written at that location. And then you hit the kernel. And the kernel goes and reads out that memory out of the, out of the, uh, the user space memory again. And it's completely different. So it's a total bypass, a relatively easy total bypass of any kind of, uh, of you know, intercepting those things. Um, to fix this requires either um, interaction with the, the LSM layer to get at the information once it's been processed by the kernel. Uh, and that's a, a sort of what uh, Landlock LSM uh, is looking to do, because you can have a programmatic way to describe an LSM policy. Uh, because right now, most uh, LSM, like the large LSM policies, are defined by the systems administrator, not by uh, the, you know, the authors of a program. Um, the other way to solve this is to completely re-architect how the kernel processes arguments. <laughs> um, which maybe will happen. Uh, it would be an interesting defense against um, some aspects of, of cache timing attacks and other things. But um, it would be a lot of work to have effectively a cache of the memory you want to read out of user space. So you sort of declare, I want to be doing these things. These are what these arguments would mean. Um, and in a normal syscall, the kernel would go off and say, oh, I don't have a cache of this yet. I'll go copy it into my memory, and then I'll use it. And if you had set comp in between here, it would go do that copying first. And then if you continued the syscall, it would use the cached copy. So it's an idea to try to minimize the race or eliminate the race uh, for that kind of thing. More questions? If not, let's thank speaker. All right, thanks.